Let's put our hands together and clap and sing the song. And watch God come down and do some miracles. God is greater than my problems.
faithful. Hallelujah. Praise Amen. God Lord. is a good God, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Let's pray for our leadership churches. Our grandmother church in Prescott, Arizona. Let's pray that. Amen. They have a wonderful service this morning. Amen. Let's pray and believe God for Pastor Mitchell, Pastor Morales, the Cassios, the Galvans, and the Hearts. Amen. Let's also pray for the East Coast, Paul and Linda Campbell, and Chip and Lori Guineer in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Let's pray for the Suspanskis and the Kings and uh, the uh, uh, Spicers. Amen. Assisting there. Let's believe God for their service this morning. Amen. The altar's filled. Let's pray for people to be getting saved. Amen. Miracles to happen. Let's believe God for Keith and Carrie Sullivan in Rochester, New York. My pastor, I appreciate you praying for him and his wife and the, the ministry there and God's success to them in their new building and the upcoming Christmas play. Amen. Let's pray for uh, many people to get saved, come to Christ and uh, believe God and see uh, miracles occur. We're going to also pray for the town of Greece here. Let's pray for, amen, uh, Joe DiPaolo, Aaron, Dylan, and Kyle, uh, Miguel Nieves, Leon Fuller. We're also praying for our police officers, our firefighters, amen, that God helps them and their families, overshadowing them as they are working for us, police. Um, let's pray for our teachers here in the town and uh, all that... Uh, God is doing nurses and doctors and everybody, EMTs on the front line. We're going to pray for a couple new converts, Mario and Jovan. Amen. Amen. And uh, a last request is for Juanita. Lift her up in prayer. Amen. Amen. Usuk is working with her. Let's pray for her heart to be opened and miracles to occur. Uh, perhaps there's a need in your life that I did not mention. And I'm going to ask you to lift your hand as a sign for me. I want to pray with you. We're all going to believe God together. And uh, if you're online and you've joined us uh, via YouTube, we want to pray for you also. Your need is of a great uh, meaning to us also. We want to believe God with you for your miracle. If you're sick in your body, put your hand on that item. If it's your knee or your head or your heart is broken or whatever thing, you call out to God and he will answer. We'll pray with you. And I'm going to ask God when we subside that uh, David Bergler would open us up in prayer. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we believe you for the miraculous. God, there's nothing withheld for you. From you, God, you can do all these things and much more. God, overshadow us and bring us your presence. God, bring revival up. As in the days of Charles Finney, Lord God, I pray. 100,000 people saved, converted. God. God, bring a refreshing this morning, God. God, bring your power down in our service, God, your anointing, God, your grace to us, God. Add to this church, God, daily is the, those of you would uh, plan for great destiny and revival, God. Touch our hearts, God. Cleanse our consciences, God. Renew our vision, God. Establish this church, Lord God. We're so thankful for our leadership. Thank you for Pastor Keith and Carrie. Oh, Jesus, Sullivan. we thank you for being here with us thank this you, morning. God, we ask for you to give us the grace to turn to you oh, and get God. ourselves cleaned up so we can be useful. Because we know you yes. ask for a holy bride and we would desire to be that. We ask for that you make us holy, fill us with your spirit, let us hear your voice, see where you're going and be able to participate in what you're doing to save us this yes. way every way. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 It's wonderful to be in church. I want to thank you for coming. Hallelujah. Let's take a minute to greet one another and make everybody feel welcome.
Amen. It's wonderful to be in church. Thank you for coming. We appreciate your faithfulness to the work. Amen. And we have a few announcements for those online. If you're not aware of this, we have uh, our church service on Sunday mornings at 1030. And we have a second service at 530. Uh, we are going to be praying and calling on God. There'll be a, a second sermon that I'm preaching tonight at 630. If you'd like to come and par uh, be part of that. Amen. Wednesday night we have a midweek service uh, at 7.30 and we uh, agree before the service at 6.30 for prayer. We outreach on Saturdays at 11 o'clock. You're welcome to join us this Saturday and see what God is doing. Amen. Getting people saved, uh, inviting people to church and uh, watching what your testimony can do in the earth. Amen. If you want to be a part of that, see me after the service. I'll give you a little more details. Uh, upcoming events in um, our mother church. Uh, there's going to be a Christmas carol, a play put on with my son wrote. It's got a little bit of hip hop, a little bit of R&B, a little reggae in it. And it's going to be very enjoyable. Uh, they're kind of bringing it up to date. That's on the 16th and the 17th. If you'd like to go to one of those with us, we would kind of privilege for you to join us. Uh, the Prescott Conference is in January. Uh, 9th through the 13th in uh, our grandmother church. Amen. We're going to believe God together for souls getting saved and churches to be planted and the workers to be refreshed. We have an April conference, the 10th through the 14th. Amen. Let's believe God uh, together for that and make the trip. Also, we have a, our very own revival with Ralph Blanca on uh, June 18th. Through the 22nd, that's a full week. Every night we're going to be in church. If you could join us for that, that will uh, bring the spirit here. That will bring uh, uh, different people, bring people with you to partake in that. And uh, we'll see your friends, your family get saved. We'll see miracles occur. Uh, I know that usually the evangelist has a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. And they're going to preach up a storm, that's for sure. Amen. Let's change the order of our service and take our offering. And this is from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus 32, and it's called Offerings to Demons. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early the next day, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You guys are familiar with this scripture where Moses goes up on the mountain. God gives him the Ten Commandments. He's gone for so long. The people are frustrated. They're, you know, Aaron, make us gods that got us out of Egypt. And so uh, Aaron says, take off your rings and your gold uh, necklaces and give them to me. And he burns them and he melts them. He smelts them and he makes this giant bull and they start worshiping. And the Lord says to Moses here, go get down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And they made for themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it. It's possible for us, even as Christians, to give to things, to give money, to make sacrifices and offering to things that are not really godly. People are willing to worship demons. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen his people. Indeed, they are a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. And my wrath is so hot that I may consume them. Get out of the way, and I will make a great nation of you. He's talking to Moses. You know, Moses stays his hand. But this is an error that we can fall into also, giving to things that are not godly. People spend all kinds of money on recreation and pleasures and excessive entertainment and excessive vacations and things to satisfy their flesh. We're going into the Christmas season. Don't shout me down now. <laughs> it's a very materialistic celebration, if you can, if you can agree with me. Amen. Amen. God wants to completely destroy those, his own people, who forgot the miracle of the, all the ten plagues and all that when he brought them out of Egypt. They've forgotten that very quickly. Let's ask the usher to come forward. Let's remember what God has done for us. And as we give to God, let's have a cheerful heart, a thankfulness for what God has done. 
and especially for what God is going to do in the future. Amen. David, can you bless the offering? Yeah. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give, uh, to remind ourselves and to tell you, Lord, how grateful we are that you take care of us, that you give us what we need, that you always meet our needs, and we give back to you and give it to you, the knowing that you'll bless it for your purposes, but just to acknowledge that we'll do better with the 90 than we will with the 100, because you are faithful. Yes, amen. Thank you. You can give online if you want to click the link. God's greater. God is greater than my problems, greater than my fears. He is great. And faithful through the years. God is greater than the enemy. Bibles to Ezekiel 22. We're going to read uh, three scriptures here shortly. Some of you might remember Logan's Run from the 70s. Raise your hand if you remember that. Sci-fi. Oh, we got one. Good. <laughs> I can connect with you. This, Logan's Run was a, a futuristic movie from the 70s. It was a story about uh, uh, children who were not raised by their parents. If you remember it co correctly, uh, nobody even knew who their parents were. And uh, there was a free love society. There was no love commitment. Uh, and you could just dial in your radio if you wanted a date for the night. You could type in your suggestion and then they would be transported there to your bedroom for recreation. There was also in this society, in this movie... There was a carousel, they called it carousel, and when you uh, got to your 30th birthday, you went into a celebration, and they stood in a, uh, a ring around there, there was uh, basically an apocalyptic type of uh, civilization, they were uh, en enshrouded, or uh, they lived in these uh, buildings, everything outside was, was unfamiliar to them, but inside there was a a group of young people less than 30 years old. On your 30th birthday, you were engaged in this celebration. It was called the Renew Celebration. And there was an anti-gravity thing there. Everybody's lifted up and they're floating there. And it's the end of your life when you're 30 years old. And then they explode. Very exciting. Very uh, entertaining. And people are thinking that the belief was that you were being renewed into whatever, the next baby that's being born. Very strange. There was a false promise of being renewed, but I want to focus on the, f the fact and the idea of children being raised uh, by people that are not really their parents. They didn't know who their parents were. They were just procreating, and then the babies would go somewhere, and somebody else would raise them. And I would like to uh, read this scripture this morning, Ezekiel 22, if you brought your Bibles or you'd like to read on the overhead, verses 6 through 8. Look, the princes of Israel, each one has used his own power to shed blood in you. In you they have made light of father and mother. In your midst they have oppressed the stranger, they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and profounded, excuse me, profaned my Sabbaths. And so here we have a major prophet uh, during the time of the siege of Jerusalem where King Nebuchadnezzar has come to 
uh, bring judgment upon the people of God there. Why? Because they had they had lost a, a care and a concern about the holy things. They were not concerned about living a holy life. They weren't concerned about respecting church and respecting church attendance. There was an irreverence that everybody practiced. Amen. I've entitled this sermon, Made Light of Parents. And I want to hone in on this. If you listen to me, you're going to get a feel for what's really going on in our society. I'd like to bring back some dignity to the office of marriage. Because, you know, it was God's plan in the first place to have a man and a woman together, covenanted together, linked as one. The Bible says the two shall become one flesh and what God has put together, let no man separate. Amen. The beauty of marriage is that uh, the children have one of each to raise them. What a shame what a horrible thing to put a child in a place where they only have one. Amen. The child does not deserve anything less than a mom and a dad. As basic and essential building blocks of societies, families have a crucial role in social development, one man writes. They bear the primary responsibility for the education and the socialization of children as well as instilling values of citizenship and belonging in the society. So I'd like to first look at the need and that is to have a, a healthy view of what God has defined. In our current culture, uh, certain things are trending, certain ideas, ideas concerning marriage are being attacked. The traditional view of marriage is on the chopping block right now, you could say. Gay marriage, open marriage, common law marriage, all these things are being pushed forward, are being accepted, are being viewed as normal in light of uh, uh, traditional views of marriage. God says that marriage is virtuous. That is the bond between a man and a woman. It is something that God takes pleasure in. You know, God is a father, amen. God has a creation, amen. And Jesus has a bride. And all these things are found in the Bible. We need to understand that traditional marriage is under fire. It's being attacked. It's losing ground. It's not as popular as it used to be. And credibility is lost. Scripture teaches that the marriage bed is undefiled. We need to see that it is good for a man and a woman to be together. Man and woman. Also, we need to remember that immoral sex will be judged. It becomes a curse, actually. A curse is added to everyone who practices practices immorality, whether it's fornication, adultery, or homosexuality. Man and woman together, one of each is what God has designed for the family, for the family unit, for the way of expressing his will in the earth. How else will people be able to uh, be fruitful and multiply without a man and a woman? Can anybody say amen? It's kind of a heavy sermon this morning. Amen. But we're going to get somewhere. It's going to be all right. Amen. amen. I'm not mad at you, okay? I'm mad at the devil. I'm mad at the way things are going. What does the Bible say about marriage? Marriage involves spiritual, emotional, and physical closeness. As in the Old Testament, we are taught that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's Genesis 224, married couples are meant to be unified in every possible way. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. God says that marriage is honorable and is worthy of honor. And marriage is 
honorable and should be highly esteemed. Amen. But in today's present culture, it's portrayed more as a ball and chain. When the guys come to the bar and they're complaining about their wife or women are out shopping with, you know, they're complaining about how horrible he is and their men are complaining about how, you know, what a drag she is. I, I, got, I got to listen to her all the time. She doesn't stop talking, you know. They, 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 it's all portrayed in Hollywood and with other people and it kind of drips down and it looks like it's a big joke. And the parents become a joke to the children as well. Dad is portrayed as a bumbling idiot. Yeah. Uh, because of, you know, Hollywood and some of the, this, the movies you've watched and, you know, maybe a lot of the ads you see on TV, they, they portray that the daddy can't, can't, can't tie his shoes, he can't open the lock on the door, and so the woman has to show up and show him how to do it. You know the story. And uh, so mom is, you know, she's got everything figured out. She's wise and she's got all the answers. And so the kids, you know, they look at their mom and dad and, you know, dad's, you know, kind of useless. He's just there to, you know, pay for, you know, the mortgage or help us, you know, pay for the vacation or get us a new pair of sneakers. And mom is supposed to be our friend now. Mom is our best buddy. Have you seen that? Amen. They, they, um, they portray it. You know them as best friends, and so this this is not really what God has designed for us. So we're slipping away from that. Many pop psychologists encourages mom to be the kid's best friend, and that can't happen. We need to see that there's a better way of thinking about marriage and parenting. We need to have a better perspective as a culture about the legitimacy of marriage. And yet today, many are encouraged to divorce. Some of you have heard the ads on the radio, uh, Selena and Barnes. I think it's not Selena now, but he says, uh, yeah, call for a uh, complimentary cons consultation and we'll talk about you, you know, splitting from the love of your life. You've had those kids, you made those vows, but don't worry about it. I'm going to help you figure things out. That one turns my stomach. You know, you know, my wife's, you know, she's not helping me out anymore. I'm not feeling happy anymore. It's like a big drag on my, my, uh, my husband, you know. I'm not happy anymore. Ah, I'm not happy. Hmm, shucks. You know, and so I'm not self-actualizing anymore. I'm not becoming all that I can be because of him. Or because of her. And so it's encouraged in our society to just give up and go find another spouse. Just get ready to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. We need to see that marriage is a covenant. And something beautiful is created when people give themselves up for the other. It's a picture of Love, it's a picture of self-sacrifice. It's something that God has created. The marriage uh, and uh, parents together, amen. It's something that is wonderful. Amen, they're sacrificing. They love each other. There's a virtue to that. There's something that's admirable. And there's also an obedience in serving your spouse. Something glory. God is glorified in these things, and people, regular people, just don't really get it. It seems there's a clear demonstration of Christian values in uh, our spouses and our sacrifices, and sacrifice to the children, setting them up for a great heritage of future blessing, and then maybe one day they'll have their own children. And they will have seen your example and care. They'll want to do it. They'll want to have kids. Then Benson commentary, he says, In thee have they set light by father and mother. And he's getting into the Hebrew language and giving us a better, clearer understanding. He says, Disobedience to or slighting of parents is unnatural. It's brutish in itself and had in particular a curse denounced against it by God's law. 
Amen. Honor your father and mother. And it's one of the big ten. I mean, sinners on the street know a few of them, right? That's one of them that they can quote. And to honor your father and mother. Amen. Something we need to be thinking about. Family is considered as one of the most important units of society because it contributes to child rearing and your place in adulthood. Adulthood, when you finally grow up and you move out, you're going to have to take responsibilities. And this is all learned in the context of home and family. The nuclear family is another name for it. It provides necessary forms of support that are significant to your emotional, mental, and physical well-being. Amen. Is anybody familiar here with the Nazi babies during World War II? Hitler was experimenting with uh, making these, the, the Aryan race they're called. You, anybody familiar? Help me out here. Right? And they would put, I've, I've seen a few vi uh, pictures at least of like 35 babies sitting on a table, like, and then they have a few nurses there trying to take them and raise them. It's, it's kind of bizarre. Amen. Let's look at the promise, secondly, and look into the twisted views that we have and the degradation of mother and father, how it has gone downhill. In verse 7, in you, they have made light of father and mother. Because of the leadership because of the princes, Ezekiel is prophesying here. He says it's because of your behavior that the people do not honor their mother and father anymore. And a judgment comes upon the nation. When and where was it written? The book of Ezekiel was written uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar, there was a first siege of Jerusalem, if you know the history of it, where uh, Nebuchadnezzar is uh, led by God to come and judge these people his own people, and brings him into captivity from about 592 to 570 B.C. He is uh, in Jerusalem at the time of the first siege. Uh, Ezekiel has prophecies against Judah and against Jerusalem. Why? Because of their disobedience and their wickedness against the Lord. It was only a matter of time before the nation is judged for its unholiness. Think with me for a minute about communism. Some of you say, well, communism is dead. Uh, well, it rears its ugly head once in a while. And one man wrote, totalitarian leaders both hate and fear the family. This is because totalitarians want to invest all power in themselves. And the family is a threat to this objective. This is made apparent by example, uh, through major policies of Marxism. You can read the book. It was to destroy the family. Its policy is based on the words of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, who partnered uh, the book Origin of the Family, 1884. The book outlined how the family must be abolished. And some of the key points included, if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'll give you four of them. Uh, eliminate all religion. That was number one, which is described as the opiate of the masses. Number two, dissolve monogamy in marriage. Encourage pre- and extramarital sex and other unconstrained sexual activity, including homosexuality. Separate children from their natural parents by sending women to work in the factories. Does this sound familiar at all? <laughs> Establish daycares and nurseries so that the children will be influenced and trained by the state from their earliest years. So something is popping into my head. They tried this in Russia and it was an amazing failure. I believe it was, the, if, 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 if my memory serves me right, it was the Bolshevik Revolution and then they transitioned into the socialist idea and communism and they experimented with it and it was a huge failure and then they had to go back but we see the indoctrination of our children. That means they've been removed from their parents' influence. Provide free education for every child in public schools. Since children are the property of the state, 
We now have to take care of them, assume responsibility for their education, require equal obligation for all persons to work. Um, and he adds here, ironically, Karl Marx himself refused to be employed during his lifetime. That's a great example. He was supported by well-off family, friends, and donors. He spent his days reading and writing. But the state, back to the scripture here, the state must control the fam must control the education of the children and their influence. Why? Because we own you. That was Karl Marx. And then 150 years later, if you said this to somebody, you would, they would be like, no, it's impossible. It's mainstream right now in our culture in America. Think with me for a minute about one child in China. That was their policy for many years. Firstly, to try to control the overpopulation of their country. Methods of enforcement, making various contraceptive methods of widely available, offering financial incentives and preferential employment opportunities. For those who uh, were complied, they complied, they, who did not comply, excuse me, they employed <laughs> sanctions, whether they fined them for money or they were kept back from having a nicer job, let's say. And then even stronger, to enforce the one-child policy, they would uh, um, force them to get abortions or even sterilizations. Especially in women. Beyond the reduction in population in the one-child policy that was experimented with through China, the male child is preferred because the lines of inheritance go to him and the care of the elderly parents was by the man. So all of a sudden these little baby girls are not wanted anymore. Undesirable. There's many abortions for little girls. And there's unfortunately going to be less women for marriage. They didn't think about that, did they? There's an incredibly high proportion of elderly people now, since there's the one child policy, there's an imbalance. And a good thing that happened, I guess you could say, because of all this, was that thousands, thousands and hundreds of thousands of little girls were being adopted in America at this time because the Chinese did not want them. Children born after the first have a hard time getting birth certificates. So if you were going to have a second child, their life would be miserable and the state would make sure of that. Amen. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Amen. And this is what happens when we mess with God's plans. We mess with what God says, I want it to be this way. This is the best way. And these are the results of messing with God's plan for family and having kids. Honor your father and mother. May God warns his people, never forget where you came from. You came from a mother and a father. I mean, I'm not gonna get into it if, you know, you had a corrupted family upbringing. Um, but you know, God has a plan to, to help you if you're broken because of that. Amen. But the, the picture in the Bible that we see, the best way of doing it is mother and father. Many scriptures promise blessing to those who honor their parents. And a likewise, the opposite will occur, that a curse is put upon people who neglect to respect their parents. They disobey them. They dishonor them by not listening to them. Ralph and... Dorothy Kohler have been celebrating 86 years of marital bliss, making them the longest living married couple in the nation. It's a milestone that was recognized by Congress last year, honored with an award. The Indio couple tied the knot uh, in Nebraska in 1935 when he was 18 years old and she was 17 years old. Yeah. God, that's a long time, buddy. After initially getting denied for marriage license by a court who believed the couple was too young to take the leap, the pair went elsewhere, exchanged their vows, and have been inseparable ever since. Mm -hmm. Amen. Prayer. Prayer. 
Praise God. Marriage is encouraged by Jesus. And it's and divorce is discouraged. Amen. And we're going to see in scripture here, Matthew 19, 1. Jesus had finished saying these things. He left Galilee, went to the region of Judea, the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And some Pharisees came. They're not even caring about the miracles that God is do doing through Jesus, but they came to test him. They're trying to throw Jesus off his game. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? For any and every reason. Haven't you read Jesus replies? That at the beginning the creator made them male and female. And said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother. And be united to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So that they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined let no man separate. Why then, they asked, why did Moses command that a man could give his wife a certificate of divorce and send it away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wife because of the hardness of your heart. But this was not so from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. Amen. So we can never get in between somebody, a, a, a husband and a wife, or a wife and a husband, and encourage them to get divorced or step into that. And because then we're going to be accountable for whatever we tell them to do or whatever we advise. And that's a very frightening thing if they're supposed to still be married. If they're going to get divorced because of immorality, well, that's a different thing. But it was not so from the beginning. Marriage has always been encouraged. And divorce has always been forbidden or not allowed. And I want to close this morning in obtaining that blessing of uh, parents. The blessing comes to a godly marriage. Amen. With something called marital bliss. The Bible talks about laying down your life. And serving other people. Marriage is one of the finest examples that we have in scripture. Which demonstrates these qualities. It gives you an opportunity to forgive. Can you say amen? Right? Yeah. To forgive. To learn how to love. And learn how to sacrifice. Amen. Ephesians talks about husbands. Um, you know, dying for your wife. As Jesus died for the church. And then that's scriptural. That's something that we need to uh, learn how to do as husbands. Amen. Amen. Marriage can be a real joy. Amen. Yep. Praise God. Think about the song of Solomon. Amen. Some of you would think, well, Solomon had thousands of wives, didn't he? How can he write on this? Yeah. Right? Well, this is about his one wife. When he wrote this, he said... Uh, you have captured my heart, my love, my sister, my bride. You have captured my heart. With one glance from your eyes, with one strand from your necklace, how beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. Your loving is so much better than wine, and your fragrance is better than any perfume. And then think about all the wonderful emotions you feel, you know, with your spouse, Maybe you're not married today, but, you know, the joy of being married, being united to somebody else. I mean, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's hard. You're making decisions. But the joy that you eventually get to be, you know, experiencing, it doesn't match anything else. Being married. Amen. Think about those wonderful things. And having children and raising them together. What a privilege it is. But we just came from our um, Thanksgiving in Buffalo. We were with our family and I had all my sons with me and my daughters and their grandchildren. And, and what a joy it was to be there. Amen. Ecclesiastes 4 talks about marriage also. 
that two are better than one because they have a good return for their hard work. If either should fall, one can pick up the other. But how miserable are those who fall and don't have any companion to help them up? Also, if two lie down together, then they can stay warm. But how can anyone stay warm alone? Also, one can be overpowered. But if two are together, they can put up a resistance. And a three-ply cord is not easily broken. That is the uh, strength of your marriage, husband, wife, and God, when you three are all linked together. There's an extra strength there. There's a power. There's a powerful witness. Amen. And God brings to every family. Amen. The heritage of the Lord. Children are a blessing. Amen. Psalm 127 verses 3 through 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like the arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not put to shame. He shall not be put to shame, excuse me, when he speaks with his enemies in the great, in the gate. Amen. And God has called you and I to understand that parents have such a great value. The family unit has such a power. And there's a great need in our society as kids are rebelling left and right from their families ever increasingly more and more to realize, amen, that honoring your parents is going to bring a blessing into your life, amen, that nobody else can take away. Amen. Let's close our eyes. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness and your attention to this issue. But I'd like to give an altar call, and that is for those who are not saved. You have never been born again. You are living a life. You're like wandering. Maybe you came from a kind of a family where you didn't have the best examples. Maybe, you know, you think of that Prince song, but what about the doves? He says, you know, you're just like your mother. And I'm just like my father. You know what I'm saying? That things fall uh, down to us and into our spirits and it, sometimes it's environmental and things are given to us through our family and maybe you're not saved today because of what you saw in your parents amen the bible says that you need to be born again you get a new family when you become a Christian you surrender your life to Jesus Christ and he brings that blessing to you. The Bible says that we're all sinners and we've all sh fallen short of God's glory. There's not one of us that's righteous. No, not one. We are all in a desperate situation here. We are all on our way to hell, the Bible says. But God said, not so. I have a plan and God has sent his son Jesus, amen, to become a sin sacrifice and if you believe this morning with your heart and confess with your lips and pray, the Bible teaches that your sins will be lifted off of you supernaturally and put on Jesus. Jesus has died for you. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us 2,000 years ago. And his plan is to save you today. The Bible says now is the acceptable hour. Today is the day of salvation. And that's you. You're not saved. You're not, you're not born again. You have no confidence that you're right with God. And if you were to die, uh, leaving the parking lot, you're not sure where you wind up, heaven or hell. And I, I would like to pray with you this morning. If you're not saved, you're ready to give your life to Jesus. You're ready to commit your heart to him and begin to serve him and do his will. Amen. That's you. Uh, with an uplifted hand, anybody like to pray this morning? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.
that perhaps you're backslidden. Amen. At one time you were right with God. You did have a vibrant reality working inside of you. Your decisions were all about Jesus. Taking a job, going somewhere, you know, you know, listening to people. The way that you lived your life. You were on fire at one time. You loved to go to church. You loved to outreach and evangelize. You love to sing songs and worship God, but now you find yourself backslidden. That means you're cold in your heart. You're not doing God's will. You're not right with Him. Amen. That's you this morning. We'd like to pray with you with an uplifted hand if that's you. You want to get, get right with God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And this is the most important part of our service. Getting right with Jesus. Think about it. When people repent, all of heaven rejoices. This is the most essential element of our service. Giving people an opportunity to repent. And if that's you, you're not saved. Or you're backslidden. Amen. Maybe that's you online and you sense that God is calling you. And I'd like to pray with you right now that you would get right with God. Don't put it off for another day. You enjoy watching the videos or this is maybe the first time you've tuned in to YouTube and you want to get right with God. God's calling you. God expects a verdict, a decision that comes from your heart. Are you going to do God's will or not? Amen. If you'd like to pray with me, I'll pray a sinner's prayer with you. If you believe what I'm saying is true and it's that important to do right now, then you should do it. Amen. So close your eyes and pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. I thank you for the gospel, the good news. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse my conscience and help me to start over. I thank you for your promises and I repent of every last sin. I turn away from my old life and I will follow you and I will be obedient to your voice. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's change the order of the service. I'd like to open up the altars if you would like to come forward and pray for any reason. Amen. Making light of parents is not very helpful. Amen. We need to see the benefit, the dignity, and the honor that parents deserve. Amen. Let's sing this song together. All in all.
together and sing it one more time. Jesus, let oh God lift up your hands and worship him. tonight at 5.30 for prayer and 6.30 for our evening service. Brother David, can you bless us as we leave? Yeah, Father, we thank you that when we go, we know we go and you go with us. Within us. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us, protect us, comfort us. We thank you that we're not going out by ourselves, but we're going out with you to follow you and to be fruitful. Give us the grace to hear your voice and do what you ask us to do this week. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming.